This is lecture number 44 in the ABCs of Communism, um, which accompanies chapter 61 in next year's uh, ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2017. When you get that book, uh, that's what it'll be chapter, in cha the text for that will be in chapter 61. And you may recall that we have discussed the primitive communist prehistory of Chile and its transition to the servitude epic as well as the colonial and early capitalist history in chapter 38. Now, this is chapter is called The Empire Strikes Back Against Chile. Well, so I'm not going to go over the colonial and early capitalist history or the primitive communist history because we've already done that. You can go back and look at those lectures if, uh, if you wish. Now, you'll recall that by the 1920s, the emerging middle and working classes were powerful enough to elect a reformist president named Arturo Alessandri Palma. Now, Alessandri appealed to three groups of white workers. Those who believed, first of all, and those who believed in the social, that the social questions of the country should be addressed. And secondly, to those who worried about the decline in nitrate exports that occurred during World War I. And thirdly, to those weary of presidents dominated by Congress. Now, promising evolution to avoid revolution, as, he, as Alessandri called it in his campaign slogan, he pioneered a new campaign style of appealing directly to the masses with florid oratory and charisma. After winning a seat in the Senate representing the mining north in 1915, he had earned the sobriquet Lion of Tarapaca kind of like the Lion of the Lord, I guess, in uh, Salt Lake City. But at any rate, as a dissident liberal running for the presidency, Alessandri supported, attracted support from the more reformist radicals and Democrats, and he formed what was called the Liberal Alliance. He received strong backing from middle and working classes, as well as from the provincial elites. Students and intellectuals also rallied to his banner. At the same time, he reassured the landowners that social reform would be limited to the cities. In other words, this wasn't uh, his social reforms weren't going to affect the uh, wealthy landholding latifundistas. But the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 changed everything. Lenin's 1919 issuing of the 21 points brought Bolshevism to Latin America, and we discussed that in the previous lectures. Accordingly, panic set in among the ruling families in Chile. Alessandri soon discovered that his efforts to lead a reformist administration would be blocked by the conservative Congress, and like President Balaceda, he infuriated the legislatures, legislators by going over their heads to appeal to the voters in the congressional elections of 1924. His reform legislation was finally rammed through Congress under pressure from younger military officers who were sick of the neglect of the armed forces, political infighting, social unrest, galloping in, uh, inflation, and uh, whose program was frustrated by the conservative Congress. So a double military coup set off a period of great political instability that lasted until 1932. First, military right-wingers opposing Alessandri seized power in September 1924, and then reformers in favor of the ousted president took charge in January 1925. Then there was the Saber Noise incident, Ruido de Sables, in uh, September 1924. This, in actuality, was a revolt of young army officers, mostly the lieutenants from middle and working classes, it led to the establishment of the September Junta, led by General Luis Altamirano, and the exile of Alessandri. Now, fears of a conservative restoration in the progressive sectors of the army led to another coup in January 1925, which ended with the establishment of the January Junta as interim government while waiting for Alessandri's return. And the latter group was led by two colonels, Colonel Ibanez del Campo and Marmaduke Grove. They returned Alessandri to the presidency in March 1925 and enacted his promised reforms by decree. The latter reassumed power in March and a new constitution 
encapsulating his proposed reforms was ratified in a plebiscite in September of 1925. The new constitution gave increased powers to the presidency. Alessandri broke with the classic liberalism policies of laissez-faire by creating the central bank and imposing a revenue tax. Social discontent was crushed, leading to the Borussia Massacre in March 1925, and that was followed by the La Coruña Massacre. Ten governments that existed between 1924 and 1932. The longest lasting of these governments was that of President General Carlos Ibanez. He briefly held power in 1925, and then again between 1927 and 1931. When constitutional rule began in 1932, a strong petty bourgeois party, the Radical Party, became the organizing entity of coalition governments for the next 20 years. <clears throat> During the period of Radical Party dominance, 1932 to 1952, the state increased its role in the economy. In 1952, voters returned to Banyas to office for another six years, and Jorge Alessandri succeeded Ibanez in 1958. <coughs> in this period, there was another massacre called the Seguro Obrero Massacre that took place on September 5th, 1938, and at that time there was a heated three-way election campaign being conducted between the ultra-conservative Gustavo Ross Santa Maria the radical popular front's Pedro Aguirre Cerda, and the newly formed Popular Alliance candidate Carlos Ibanez del Campo. The National Socialist Movement of Chile supported Ibanez's candidacy, which had been announced on September 4th. In order to prevent Ross's victory, the National Socialist mounted a coup d'etat that was intended to take down the right-wing government of Arturo Malsandre Palma and place Ibanez in power. Now, in 1964, there was a presidential election of Christian Democrat Eduardo Frey Montalva by an absolute majority, a majority initiated by a period of major reform under the slogan, Revolution and Liberty. The Frey administration embarked on what the relatively progressive bourgeoisie in Chile thought would be adequate social and economic programs in education, housing, and agrarian reform. The government allowed limited rural unionization of agricultural workers, and in 1967, Frey encountered increasing opposition from the left and the right at the end of his term. Frey had accomplished only a few of his goals. Now, to bring us up to the modern period, we have the popular unity government that was formed after the 1970 presidential election by Senator Salvador Allende Cosmos, who won a plurality of votes in a three-way contest. Allende was a Marxist physician and a member of Chile's Socialist Party and chief of the Popular Unity, UP or Unidad Popular, coalition. This was a grouping of socialist, communist, radical, and social democratic parties along with dissident Christian Democrats, the Popular Unitary Action Movement, MAPU, and the Independent Popular Action. Allende had two main competitors in this election, Radomiro Tomic, Christian Democratic Party candidate, and the right-wing former president, Jorge Alessandri. In the end, Allende received a plurality of the votes cast, getting 36% of the vote against Alessandri's 34%, and Tomek's 27 percent. Subversion from the government of the United States along with the Chilean Congress, keeping with tradition, organized a runoff vote between the leading candidates, Allende and former President Jorge Alessandri. The murder of the Army Commander-in-Chief General Ale Schneider and Frey's refusal to form an alliance with Alessandri gave Allende the vote of 153 to 35 in Congress. The Popular Unity domestic platform called for the nationalization of U.S. interests in Chile's major copper mines, assurance of workers' rights, a deepening of the Chilean land reform, and the reorganization of the national economy into socialized, mixed, and private sectors, and the creation of a unicameral Congress. 
In foreign policy, popular unity called for international solidarity, national independence, and a new institutional order featuring a people state, or Poder Popular. Salvador Allende himself was born on the 26th of June, 1908, and was murdered on 11 September, 1973, by the CIA and the Pinochet gang. Allende's political life spanned a period of nearly 40 years. As a member of the Socialist Party, he was a senator, deputy, and cabinet minister. He unsuccessfully ran for president of the presidency in the 1952, 1958, 1964 election. In 1970, he won the presidency in a close three-way race, and Congress had elected him then in a runoff as the candidate with the most votes. Now, this year, uh, 1970, was a year that um, I was real busy in my doctoral program. I had done my first year of research along the Skeen River in northern British Columbia. And when I went to Mexico City to give the, my paper on, on the results of that um, in uh, 1970, it was May, and this election was still six months away. And I didn't pay a lot of attention to the Chilean situation at that particular time. All of this was about to change. And um, as we go along, I'll mention that uh, I got involved in some of this, under, and you'll see how and why. At any rate, on the 11th of September 1973, the military moved to oust Allende in a coup d'etat sponsored by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Um, the CIA doesn't bother to deny any of this. They have, uh, uh, actually, they've been pretty proud of what they achieved there, and they've bragged about it in a whole bunch of publications. Uh, following Allende's murder, General Augusto Pinochet ruled via a military junta. The junta government lasted until 1990. The military junta that took over dissolved the Congress of Chile and began a persecution of all opponents in which thousands of Allende supporters were kidnapped, tortured, and murdered. And, um, well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Allende's er early life, uh, he, first of all, he was born in, on the 26th of June, 1908, as I said, in Santiago. He was the son of Salvador Allende Castro and Lauren Gossens Uribe. Allende's family belonged to the Chilean upper middle class and had a long tradition of political involvement in progressive and liberal causes. His grandfather was a prominent physician and a social reformist who founded one of the first secular schools in Chile. Salvador Allende was of Belgian and Basque, that's the father uh, of uh, our, uh, our Allende. Um, he was um, of Basque, Belgian and Basque descent. Now, Allende attended high school at the Liceo Eduardo de la Barra in Valparaiso. As a teenager, his main intellectual and political influence came from the shoemaker Juan de Marchi, an Italian-born anarchist, and we discussed that in anarchism in Chile in, in the previous lectures. Allende was a talented athlete in his youth, being a member of the Everton de Viña del Mar Sports Club, named after the more famous English football club of the same name excelling at the long jump. Allende then graduated with a medical degree in 1933 from the University of Chile, and during medical school, um, Professor Max Westenhofer, a German pathologist who stressed the social determinants of disease and social medicine, influenced Allende, and in 1933, Allende wrote a book that, that followed that thinking, which um, was a, an elaboration of his doctoral thesis, which is called Crime and Mental Hygiene in English. At any rate, um, Allende became a founder of the Socialist Party of Chile in 1933 with Marmaduke Grove and others. The founding meeting was held in Valparaiso, where Allende was the chairman. He married Hortensia Busi, B-U-S-S-I, with whom he had three daughters, he was a Freemason from the Progressive Lodge No. 4 in Valparaiso, and in 1933, as I say, he published his, also his doctoral 
dissertation which was called Crime and Mental Hygiene in English. In 1938, Allende was in charge of the electoral campaign of the Popular Front. Now, the Popular Front slogan at that time was, Bread, a Roof, and Work. After its electoral victory, he became Minister of Health in the reformist Popular Front government, which was dominated by the petty bourgeois radical party. While serving in this position, Allende was responsible for the passage of a wide range of progressive social reforms, which included safety laws, protecting workers in the factories, higher pensions for widows, maternity care, and free lunch programs for school children. Upon entering the government, Allende relinquished his congressional seat for Valparaiso, which he had won in 1937, um, and he wrote that uh, Social and Medical Reality of Chile in 1937. After the Crystal died in Nazi Germany, Allende and other members of the Congress sent a telegram to Adolf Hitler denouncing the persecution of Jews, and following President Aguirre Cerda's death in 1941, he was again elected deputy, and the Popular Front renamed Democratic Alliance. In 1945, Allende became senator for the Valdivia, Lanquije, Chiloé, and Aysén, and Magallanes provinces. Then for Tarapaca, Antofagasta, in 1953, and for Aconcagua and Valparaiso in 1961, and once more for Chilo, Chiloé, Aysen, and Magallanes in 1969. He became president of the Chilean Senate in 1966, and during the 50s, Allende introduced legislation that established the Chilean National Health Service, the first American nation after Cuba, to guarantee universal health care. Now, as a presidential candidate, he had made three unsuccessful bids for the presidency in the 1952, 1958, and 1964 elections. Declassified documents show that from 1962 through 1964, the CIA spent a total of $2.6 million to finance the campaign of Eduardo Fry and spent $3 million in anti-Allende propaganda to scare voters away from Allende's FRAP, F-R-A-P, coalition. Now this, remember that these dollars are of those years, and this is before the 1971 500% devaluation of the dollar of President Nixon. So if you want, if you want to get the correct comparative date amount of money today would be about seven or eight times these figures. At any rate, the CIA considered its role in the victory of Frey a great success. They argued that, quote, the financial and organizational assistance given to Frey, the effort to keep Duran in the race, the propaganda campaign to denigrate Allende, were indispensable ingredients of Frey's success, unquote. They thought, they thought that his chances of winning with and the good progress of his campaign would have been doubtful without the covert support of the government of the United States. Thus, in 1964, Allende lost once more at the as the FRAP candidate. Now, Allende had a close relationship with the Chilean Communist Party from the beginning of his political career. On his fourth and successful bid for the presidency, the Communist Party supported him as the alternate for its own candidate, the world-renowned poet Pablo Neruda. During his presidential term, Allende shared communist positions. Now, so finally, in the 1970 election, Allende won. As the leader of the Unidad Popular and the Popular Unity, Co Popular Unity Coalition on the 4th of September, 1970. Now that's the first time, looking back on it, I, mean, that I became aware of the situation in Chile on, on a rather continuing basis. But uh, at any rate, according to the Chilean constitution of the time, if no presidential candidate obtained, obtained a majority of the popular vote, Congress would choose one of the two candidates with the highest number of votes as the winner. Traditionally, the Congress did uh, this by voting for the candidate with the highest popular vote, regardless of margin. Now one month, and they did it again. Now one month after the election on 20th of October 67, a CIA-sponsored group led by General Roberto Val shot General Ine Schneider, Commander-in-Chief of the Chilean Army, resisting a kidnapped attempt. 
but he died of his wounds in the hospital three days later on the 23rd of October. Schneider was a defender of the constitutionalist doctrine that the Army's role is exclusively professional, its mission being to protect the country's sovereignty and not to interfere in politics. Allende assumed the presidency on the 3rd of November 1970 after signing a statute of constitutional guarantees proposed by the Christian Democrats in return for their support in Congress. Allende began to carry out his platform of implementing uh, a socialist program called La Nia Chilena al Socialismo, the Chilean path to socialism, immediately. Specifically, this called for the nationalization of banking and large-scale industries such as copper mining and the government administration of both health care and educational systems. Now, those the Catholic Church was real upset about the net, about making educational education secular as they always have been in every country where they controlled education. And so they became immediately involved with the CIA program to destroy the socialist government. Allende hired U.S. educator Jane A. Hobson Gonzalez from Kokomo, Indiana to implement a program of free milk for children in the schools and shanty towns of Chile. He initiated an expansion of the land seizure and redistribution already begun under his predecessor, Eduardo Frey Montalva, and he intended to improve the socioeconomic welfare of Chile's poorest citizens as an essential element that this would be to provide employment either in the new nationalized enterprises or in public works projects. And he got right to work on all of this. In November 1970, 3,000 scholarships were allocated to Mapuche children, integration, uh, integrating the Indian minority into the educational system meant a payment of pensions and grants was resumed. An emergency plan providing for the construction of 120,000 residential buildings was launched in November of 1970, and laws were passed uh, giving rights to part-time workers for Social Security. A pro proposed increase in electricity prices of the preceding regime was withdrawn and electricity rates were lowered. Diplomatic relations were restored with Cuba in 1971. Cuba, Chile re-established those relations joining Mexico and Canada in rejecting a previously established Organization of American States convention prohibiting governments in the Western Hemisphere from establishing diplomatic relations with Cuba. Shortly after, Cuban President Fidel Castro made a month-long visit to Chile. Originally, the visit was supposed to be one week, however. Castro enjoyed Chile and in one week led to another until he had been there for a month. You recall that the Organization of American States was a completely gringo-controlled organization that did exactly what, whatever the bosses in Washington told it to do in those days, and still is pretty much, which is why Raul Castro said the other day that Cuba would never go back to the OAS, even though they can <coughs> now. And the preceding regime's political prisoners were granted an amnesty. In December 1970, bread prices were fixed, and 55,000 volunteers were sent to the south of the country, Cuban style, to teach writing and reading skills and provide medical attention to a, a huge sector of the population that had previously been completely ignored. And this is like within days of the, uh, uh, the administration taking over. <coughs> so, you can see he got right down to work. A central commission was established to oversee a tripartite payment plan in which equal place was given to governments, employees, and employers. A protocol agreement was signed with the United Center of Workers, which granted workers representational rights on the funding board of the Social Planning Ministry. An obligatory minimum wage for workers of all ages, including apprentices, was established. Free milk was introduced for expect expectant and nursing mothers and for children between the ages of 7 and 14. Free school meals were established. Rent reductions were carried out, and the construction of the Santiago subway was rescheduled to serve working-class neighborhoods first. 
Workers benefited from increases in Social Security payments and expanded Public Works program and a modification of the wage and salary adjustment mechanism. Middle income Chileans benefited from the elimination of taxes on modest, modest incomes and property, and government sponsored programs distributed free food to the country's neediest citizens. In the countryside, peasant councils were established to mobilize agrarian workers and small proprietors. In the government's first budget in November 1970, the minimum taxable income was raised. This was a giant tax break for the 35% of those who had paid taxes on earnings in the previous year. In addition, the exemption from general taxation was raised to a level equivalent to twice the min minimum wage, and capital gains taxes were eliminated for 330,000 small proprietors. The armed forces' wages were increased. Accordingly, popular purchasing power went up by 28 percent between October 1970 and July 1971. <coughs> the rate of inflation fell from 36% in 1970 to 22% in 1971, while average real wages rose by 22% during 1971. Minimum real wages for blue-collar workers were increased by 56% during the first quarter of 1971, and in the same period, real minimum wages for white-collar workers were increased by 23%. Federal expenditures went up by 36% in real terms, raising the share of fiscal spending in GDP from 21% in 1970 to 27% in 1971. <coughs> the public sector <coughs> engaged in a huge housing program featuring 76,000 house starts in 1971 compared to 24,000 for 1970. During a 1971 emergency program, over 89,000 houses were built. During Allende's three years as president, an average of 52,000 houses were constructed every year. Allende's first step in early 1971 had been to raise minimum wages for blue collar workers, as we've seen. And that was rated, uh, those wages rose 37 to 41 percent for blue collar workers. 8 to 10 percent for white collar workers. Educational, food, and housing significant assistance was significantly expanded. Public housing starts going up 1,200 percent, and eligibility for free milk extended from age 6 to age 15. In 1972, blue collar wages were raised by 27 percent, and white collar wages became fully indexed. Price controls were also set up and the government introduced a system of distribution networks to ensure that shopkeepers adhered to the new rules. And finally, the latifundia was extinguished. The new Minister of Agriculture, Jock Chun Cho, promised to expropriate all estates which were larger than 80 basic hectares. No farm in Chile exceeded this limit by December 1972. So in one year, he had eliminated this uh, centuries-old latifundia class of landowners who had thousands of acres of land that, uh, that they ran kind of like feudal barons. Within 18 months, the latifundia had been totally abolished and the reverium reform had involved the expropriation of 3,479 properties, which added to the 1,408 taken by the previous government made up some 40 percent of the total agricultural land area of the country, and it was the best land. <coughs> in rural areas, the government launched a campaign against illiteracy, ex expansion of adult education programs, and a new educational opportunity for workers. From 1971 through 1973, enrollments in kindergarten, primary, secondary, and post-secondary schools all increased. Excuse me. The Allende government encouraged more doctors to begin their practice in rural and low middle income urban areas and built additional hospitals, maternity clinics, and especially neighborhood health centers that remained open longer hours to serve the poor. 
improved sanitation and housing facilities for low-income neighborhoods, equalized health care benefits, while hospital councils and local health councils were established in neighborhood health centers as a means of democratizing the administration of health policies. <coughs> These councils gave central government, civil servants, local government officials, health service employees, and community workers the right to review budgetary decisions. The government brought the arts to the mass of the Chilean population by funding a number of cultural events with 18-year-olds and illiterates now granted the right to vote educational programs were established. Ruling class structures were now challenged by the socialist egalitarianism. The government was able to draw upon the idealism of its supporters with teams of Allendistas traveling into the countryside and shanty towns to perform volunteer work. The Allende government also worked to transform Chilean popular culture through formal changes to the school curriculum and through broader cultural education events music festivals and tours of Chilean folklorists and Nueva Canción musicians were common. In 1971, the purchase of a private publishing house by the government gave rise to Editorial Quimantú. Editorial is, uh, in Spanish is the usual term for a publisher, which became the center of the Allende government's cultural activities in the space of two years, 12 million copies of books, magazines, and documents, 8 million of which were books, specializing in social analysis, were published. Cheap editions of great literary works were introduced on a weekly basis, and in most cases were sold out within a day. Culture came into the reach of the masses for the first time, who responded enthusiastically. Editorial Kimantu encouraged the establishment of libraries and community organizations and trade unions through the supply of cheap textbook to in, textbooks. It, it enabled the le left to progress through the ideological content of the literature made available to workers. To improve social and economic conditions for women, the Women's Secretariat was established in 1971. This secretariat took on issues such as the public laundry facilities, public food programs, day daycare centers, and women's health care, especially prenatal care. The duration of maternity leave was extended from 6 to 12 weeks, while the Allende government veered the educational systems toward poorer Chileans by expanding enrollments through government subsidies. <coughs> A democratization of university education was carried out, making the system tuition free, and this led to an 89% rise in university enrollments between 1970 and 1973. The Allende government also increased enrollment in secondary education from 38% in 1970 to 51% in 1974. Enrollment in education reached record levels, including 3.6 million young people and 8 million school textbooks that were distributed among 2.6 million pupils in primary education. Unprecedentedly, 130,000 students were enrolled by the universities, which became accessible to peasants and workers, and the illiteracy rate was reduced from 12% in 1970 to 10.8% in 1972, while the growth of enrollment in primary schools um, <coughs> excuse me, increased from an annual average of 3.4% in the period 1966-70 to 60.5% in 1971-72, and secondary education grew at a rate of 18.2% in 1971-1972, and the average school enrollment of children between the ages of 6 and 14 rose from 91% in 1966 to 70 to 99%. <coughs> Social spending for housing, education, and health became a priority as a result of the new initiatives in nutrition and health. Together with higher wages, many poorer Chileans were able to feed themselves and clothe themselves as better uh, than ever before, and public access to the social security system was made nearly universal, 
as were benefits in the form of family allowances. The redistribution of income enabled wage and salary earners to increase their share of national income from 52% to 65%, while family consumption increased by 13% in the government's first year. The average annual increase in personal spending went from 5% to 12% in 1971. During the first two years of Allende's presidency, government expenditures on health rose from around 2% to nearly 3.5% of GDP, and new spending was ordered in public health campaigns and in the construction of the health infrastructure. Programs targeted at, women's, um, at women, such as cooperative laundries and communal food preparation, together with an expansion of child care facilities, were launched. The National Supplementary Food Program became available to all primary school children and to all pregnant women, regardless of their employment or income condition. Complementary nutritional schemes were applied to malnourished children, while pre-antenatal care was, that's afterbirth after care was just emphasized. Under Allende, the proportion of children under the age of six with some form of malnutrition fell by 17%. Apart from the existing community-based supply and prices councils, community-based distribution centers, and shops were created, and these sold directly in working-class neighborhoods. The government intervened in marketing activities so that the government involved in grocery distribution reached 33%. So much of this would be cut, like the Pemex Union stores that exist in uh, Mexico. But at any rate, this applied to the entire country, not just to uh, the oil union workers. The Central Labor Confederation was accorded legal recognition, CUT, and its membership grew, uh, grew from 700,000 to almost 1 million. It enterprises in the area of social ownership and assembly of workers elected half of the members of the management council for each company. These bodies replaced the former board of directors. Now at this point, more sober assessment by Yendi and his cabinet should have told them that the Caps would not sit still for all of this. Fidel Castro had warned them on his visit and had given Allende a Tommy gun as a president, reminding him that the class struggle would eventually become violent. <coughs> Nevertheless, the government proceeded as, as if it had the state apparatus, that is, army and police, in its hands. And this was just dreaming. At any rate, minimum pensions were increased two to three times, the inflation rate between 1970 and 1972, such pensions increased by a total of 550 percent. The government, from one-third of the minimum salary to the full amount, increased the incomes of 300,000 retirement pensioners. Labor insured, uh, insurance was extended to 200,000 market traders, 130,000 small shop proprietors, and 30,000 small industrialists, small owners transport workers, clergy, professional sportsmen, and artisans were all covered. The Public Health Service now featured the establishment of a system of clinics in working class neighborhoods on the peripheries of the major cities, providing a health center for every 40,000 inhabitants. Statistics for construction in general, and house building in particular, <coughs> reached some of the highest levels in the history of Chile. Four million square meters were completed in 1971-72, compared to an average annual two and a half million between 1965 and 1970. Workers were able to acquire goods which had previously been beyond their reach, such as heaters, refrigerators, and television sets. At any rate, by now meat was no longer a luxury and the children of all working people were adequately supplied with shoes and clothing. The popular living standards in terms of the employment situation, social services, consumption levels, and income distribution had never been as high. In the first year of Allende's term, the short-term economic results of the ministry, Minister of the Economy, Pedro Vuskovic's expansionary monetary policy were highly favorable. There was a 12% industrial growth an 8.6 percent increase in GDP, and inflation went down from 35 percent to 22 <coughs> percent. Unemployment went to 3.8 percent. However, by 1973, the Chilean economy began to suffer 
as a result of the U.S. campaign against the Allende government. The CIA led the rightist opposition via the National Party, the Roman Catholic Church, and its hatred of the government's secular educational program. Diagno a diagnostic was growing tension with foreign multinational corporations and the government of the United States, and this would lead to class war, as Fidel Castro had warned. Allende also undertook Project CyberSid, a system of networks, telex machines, and computers developed by the British cybernetics expert Stafford Beer. The network was supposed to transmit data from factories to the government in Santiago, allowing for economic planning in real time. <coughs> now, in, 19, in October 1972, that is two years into the uh, Allende period, the CIA organized a 24-day wave of strikes by truckers and later inserted CIA cadre among small businessmen, professionals, and student groups. Other than the inevitable damage to the economy, Allende felt he had to bring the head of the Army, General Carlos Prats, into the government as Interior Minister. Allende also instructed the government to begin requisitioning trucks in order to keep the nation from coming to a halt. Government supporters also helped to mobilize trucks and buses, but CIA violence served as a deterrent to full mobilization with police protection for strike breakers. Racial tensions between the poor descendants of indigenous people who supported Allende's reforms and the white elite was stepped up. Export income fell due to a hard-hit copper industry. The price of copper on international markets fell almost a third, and post-mobilization copper production fell as well. Copper, Chile's single most important export, saw its price fall to only $48 in 1971. And declines in domestic food production followed the CIA sabotage of agrarian reform. The CIA propaganda campaign accused Allende of leading Chile toward a Cuban-style dictatorship and sought to overturn many of his social policies. The Nixon administration continued exerting economic pressure on Chile via its IMF, World Bank, and other organizations. Immediately after his election, Nixon directed the CIA and U.S. State Department officials to overthrow the Allende government. Allende's popular unity government tried to maintain normal relations with the United States. Nevertheless, when Chile nationalized its copper industry, Washington cut off U.S. credits as part of its campaign to overthrow the Chilean government. Santiago was forced to seek alternative sources of trade and finance. Chile gained commitments from the Soviet Union to invest some $400 million in Chile in the next six years, but that was far less than Chile had hoped for. The modern revisionist gang in Moscow was betraying socialism in Chile as part of its deal-making with Washington. On the other hand, the People's Republic of China and some countries of Eastern Europe, like the German Democratic Republic and Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria, were of far greater assistance. Allende visited the USR in late 1972 in search of more aid and additional lines of credit, but he was turned down. Immediately after the election, the United States launched Condor 1 against Chile, imposing a number of economic sanctions against that country. The CIA's website reports that the agency aided three different Chilean opposition groups during that time period and, quote, sought to instigate a coup to prevent Allende from taking office, unquote. The action plans to prevent Allende from coming to power are known as Track 1 and Track 2. <laughs> In the first year of Allende's term, the short-term economic results of economic minister Pedro Vuskovic's expansive monetary policy were unambiguously favorable. 12% industrial growth, 8.6% increase in GDP, accompanied by major declines in inflation, down from 35 to 22 percent, and employment down to 3.8 percent. Allende adopted measures including price freezes, wage increases, and tax reforms, thus increasing consumer spending and redistributing income downward. Joint public-private public works projects helped reduce unemployment. Much of the banking sector was nationalized, 
many enterprises within the copper, coal, iron, and nitrate and steel industries were expropriated, nationalized, or subjected to some form of state intervention, and industrial output increased sharply, while unemployment fell during the administration's first year. CIA attacks via Tracks 1 and 2 in 1972 caused the Chile Chilean escudo, the name of their currency, to exhibit a runaway inflation of 140 percent. The economic depression that had begun in 1967 and had placed capitalism in question in Chile peaked in 1972 and of course this exacerbated capital flight, plummeting private investment and withdrawal of bank deposits and production fell and unemployment rose. The combination of inflation and government mandated price fixing led to the rise of black markets in rice, beans, sugar and flour and in this way track two caused an artificial disappearance of such basic commodities from supermarket shelves, something the CIA is trying to do in Venezuela and Brazil uh, today. Recognizing that the U.S. intelligence forces were trying to destabilize his presidency through a variety of methods, the KGB offered financial assistance to the first democratically elected Marxist president. 1968 tied up 20% of total U.S. foreign investment in Latin America. U.S. mining companies had invested $1 billion over the previous 50 years in Chile's copper mining industry, which was the largest in the world, sending $7.2 billion home. Part of the CIA's program involved a propaganda campaign that portrayed Allende as a would-be Soviet dictator. <coughs> in, fa in fact, quote, <coughs> the U.S. owned intelligence reports showed that Allende posed no threat to democracy, unquote. Nevertheless, the Richard Nixon administration organized and inserted secret operatives in Chile in order to quickly destabilize Allende's government. Answering this, the Soviet and Cuban intelligence services sent their own agents. And at this point, I got involved. I made innumerable trips to different parts of Chile in these years under the direction of Carlos Prieto. Let me just mention, I'm going to, I brought this little map of uh, South America and Chile to remind you the extent of the Chilean nation is very long, although it's very, it's not very wide. But you may recall from our previous lectures that there's a train that was just built from um, Buenos Aires in the early part of the 1900s to the, uh, the Argent Argentine city of Mendoza. And from there, the cattle would get out off the train and you could walk them across the mountains into uh, right at this point, where they come out just almost uh, directly. Well, of course, they still have a ways to walk, but they come out close to Santiago. Now, that was the Mendoza at that time was the place where the rescue operation for half a million uh, refugees had to flee immediately from uh, Chile when their military took over and in their bloody coup. Um, and it was the, the biggest migration of that time since the fascist regime of uh, General Franco had uh, won the Civil War in uh, Spain and half a million immediately had to run from Barcelona and other places close to the French border uh, and ended up in either Russia or, or Mexico, which had been the two major allies of the Republic. Well, the same thing was happening now. Most of them were heading through that pass that goes to Mendoza because that was the, uh, the, the easiest way to go. It wasn't the only way, but it was one of the best ways to go. And, of course, an awful lot of these um, refugees were coming out of uh, Santiago. Immediate, in the immediate flight, there was at least 200,000 people that made it through that pass. And before the 20 years of the regime, the fascist regime, the CIA set up, uh, were over, there would be half a million, ch million Chileans running. Now, an awful lot of them went to Mexico City, just like an awful lot of the Spanish refugees after the Spanish Civil War had gone to Mexico. Because in those years, Mexico was still um, a, a country that was relatively progressive compared to uh, the kind of situation that existed in most of Latin America and the uh, 
So Mexico was full of, now it was full of many Chilean refugees. And Carlos Prieto operated with, with a shortwave number station to uh, facilitate this flight of uh, he and others uh, from, uh, from Chile into Mexico. And from there, I, uh, off and on, would get involved because, uh, well, I was close to Mexico City, big in Los Angeles or, or Calgary, or whatever the case may have been. And uh, so, at any rate, that's, that's how I got involved in that. And that's the important role of the Mendoza Pass there to Santiago uh, for now, for new reasons, for the, of what I call Operation Rescue. Um, at any rate, uh, by 1972, the economic progress of Allende's first year had been reversed, and the economy was in crisis. The CIA created political polarization, and it stepped up large mobilizations of both the pro- and anti-government groups that became uh, violent inherently. And really, if, uh, well, by 1973, Chilean society had grown highly polarized between strong opponents and equally strong supporters of Salvador Allende and his government. Guerrilla opposition to the CIA stooges began in the countryside, and the CIA trial run in a military coup was staged called the Tanque Tazo in June 1973. Now, then, just a few months later, on September 11, 1973, the Chilean military deposed Allende, whom they murdered in the presidential palace as the surrounding neighborhood was bombed. Um, CIA men and their thugs from the military intelligence service of the army stormed the presidential palace and <coughs> killed all of the defenders, including the president who fought to the end with his with the machine gun that had Fidel Castro had left for him. Um, at any rate, Augusto Pinochet, as commander of the army, seized total power and established himself at the head of a junta government. The new junta was made up of General Gustavo Lee, representing the Air Force, Augusto Pinochet himself, representing the Army, Admiral Jose Turibio Marino, representing the Navy, and General Cesar Mendoza, representing the Carabineros. Uh, that's the police, on the uniformed gendarmes, the national police. The, uh, the Italy has a, always called their national cops Carabinieri. All right, now, and in the book, I have a list of every one of the members of the uh, military junta, when they took office, when they left office, uh, who, who they represented, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Carabineros. And I'm not going to read all of that because I don't think that would mean that much to you, but when you get the book, you'll have all of that data. And, and if you want, want to, you can look up these guys individually and see their history. Now, of course, this has been a long time ago, so, well, relatively speaking, so most of these men are dead in prison or uh, in hiding someplace. Uh, now, so we'll skip over though of that. CIA involvement in the coup is documented beginning with the Frank Church, uh, the Democratic Senator from Idaho, my home state, Committee Report of 1975. Publicly available documents prove the CIA attempted to prevent Allende from taking office after he was elected in 1970. The CIA itself released documents in 2000 acknowledging this and that Pinochet was their instrument. And of course, uh, and according to the Vasily Matrokin and Christopher Andrew book, the KGB and the Cuban DGI launched a campaign known as Operation Tucon. Uh, at any rate, the uh, rescue operation, which was part of that, was the one I was mentioning to you out of Mexico City. And there was a lot of killing going on down there in, in this period. The government killed 5,000 people in the first few days. Uh, on the other hand, the, the counterattack against them brought an awful lot of bodies into the lakes, too, uh, also. And, you know, there's a saying that there's never-ending love, nothing says never-ending love like capital murder. So in that sense, there was a lot of love flowing around in uh, Chile in those, in those months and uh, years. 
But at any rate, uh, looking at the Pinochet regime itself, which lasted 1973 to 1990, by early 73, inflation had risen to 800 percent under Allende's presidency as a result of the CIA's Track 1, Track 2 program. The crippled economy was further battered by prolonged and sometimes simultaneous strikes organized by the, the foreigners, the CIA, um, and uh, as we've seen, the military overthrew Allende on September 11, 73, as the armed forces bombarded the presidential palace. Uh, their secret police troops fought their way inside, murdering Allende in the process, establishing the military government that took over the country. Now, with that many refugees fleeing the country, it was impossible to keep all of the torturing, murdering, and killing a secret. So the first years of the regime featured shocking human rights violations that became known around the world. The junta jailed, tortured, and executed thousands of Chileans. In October 1973, at least 72 people were murdered by the government's caravan of death. At least 1,000 people were murdered during the first six months of Pinochet in office. 20,000 more were murdered during the next 16 years. At least 29,000 more were imprisoned and tortured. According to the Latin American Institute on Mental Health and Human Rights, situations of extreme trauma affected about 200,000 people, and this figure includes individuals killed, tortured, or exiled, and their immediate families. About 30,000 of them, they say, left the country. It was far more than that. We know that at least 200,000 escaped in the first six months. Pinochet expelled Lee from the Junta in 1978, replacing him with General Fernando Mati. The Caso de Goyalos, Slit Throats case, featured three Communist Party members assassinated. Cesar Mendoza, member of the Junta since 1973, and the chiefs of the Carbineros resigned in 1985 and were replaced by Rodolfo Sange and his group. The next year, Carmen Gloria Quintana was burned alive in what became known as the Caso Quemado, burned alive case. Gringo neoliberalism established. The four-man junta headed by General Augusto Pinochet had a program. Initially, it abolished civil liberties, dissolved the National Congress, banned all union activities, prohibited all strikes and collective bargaining, and erased the Allende administration's agrarian and economic reforms. The junta embarked on a radical program of U.S.-approved neoliberalism. It slashed tariffs as well as government welfare programs and deficits. New laws were written by a group of technocrats known as the Chicago Boys because they followed the doctrine of the University of Chicago neoliberal school. Under these new policies, the rate of inflation dropped. <laughs> and then I go through the drop in the, the rate of inflation for every year from 73 to 81 in your book when you get it. If you're interested, you can read it. A new constitution legitimized by a phony plebiscite featuring the absence of registration lists went into effect on September 11, 1980, when General Pinochet became president of the Republic for an eight-year term. Well, the 82-83 economic crisis is the next thing you want to take a look at. Chile witnessed a severe economic crisis with a surge in unemployment and meltdown of the financial sector in that period, 1982 to 1983. The iron law of capitalist production had set in and could not be reversed by a cap government. Sixteen out of fifty financial institutions faced bankruptcy. In 1982, the two biggest banks were nationalized to prevent an even worse credit crunch. And in 1983, another five banks were nationalized, and two banks had to be put under government supervision. The central bank took over foreign debts, and the economic policy of the Chicago Boys became widely known as the Chicago Way to Socialism. <laughs> At any rate, from 1985 to 1989, there was economic paralysis and the CIA changed tack. Under U.S. orders, Hernan Bucci became Minister of Finance from 1985 to 1989, and he introduced a more pragma pragmatic economic policy. He allowed the peso to float and re reinstated restrictions on the movement of capital in and out of the country. He introduced bank regulations, simplified and reduced the corporate tax. Chile went ahead with privatizations, including public utilities. However, all this simply froze the contradictions inherent in the cap economy. 
into a form of institutional paralysis. In 1988, the voters would accept or reject a single candidate proposed by the military junta in another plebiscite. And as expected, Pinochet was the candidate proposed, but he was denied a second eight-year term by 54.5% of the vote. So, the CIA decided it was through with him. U.S. corporations could not take any more financial losses, losses from financial crackpots and ordered the CIA to return the country to normalcy. Now, in that transition, the Chileans elected a new president and a majority of members of the two-chamber Congress on December 14, 1989. Christian Democrat Patricio Alwin headed the Concertacion Coalition, receiving 55% of the vote. As President Alwin served from 1990 to 1994, this was what the ruling class considered a transition period. In February 1991, Alwin created the National Commission for Truth and Reconciliation. One year later, the NCTR released the Reddig Report, cataloging some of the atrocities committed during the CIA military rule period. This report proved 2,279 disappearances. In 2004, the Balak Report counted 30,000 victims of torture after tor testimony from 35,000 persons. In December 1993, Christian Democrat Eduardo Frey Ruiz Tagle, the son of previous President Eduardo Frey Montalva, led the Concertacion Coalition to victory with 58% of the vote. Frey um, was succeeded in 2000 by the socialist Ricardo Lagos, who won in a runoff election against Joaquim Lavin of the Rightist Alliance for Chile with 51 plus percent of the vote. Now, there was a partial comeuppance to this guy Pinochet. In 1998, he traveled to London for back surgery. He was arrested there under orders of the Spanish judge, Baltasar Garzón. The seizure of Pinochet in London naturally attracted worldwide attention for the obvious reason, and because this was one of the first arrests of a former president based on the universal jurisdiction principle for those charged with crimes against humanity. Of course, the CIA mobilized all their resources to rescue Pinochet and tried all their arguments, which were rejected by British courts. However, UK Home Secretary Jack Straw took the responsibility to release him on medical grounds, refusing to extradite him to Spain to face Judge Garzon. Pinochet returned to Chile in March 2000. Upon descending the plane in Santiago in a wheelchair, he stood up and saluted the cheering crowd of supporters, including an army band playing his favorite military march tunes. Newly inaugurated President Ricardo Lagos commented that the retired general's televised arrival had damaged the image of Chile as tens of thousands demonstrated against him. Bachelet and Piñera The Concertacion Coalition has continued to dominate Chilean politics for the last two decades including to this very day. In January 2006, Chileans elected their first woman president, Michelle Bachelet of the Socialist Party. She was sworn in on March 11, 2006, extending the Concertacion Coalition governance for another four years. In 2002, Chile signed an association agreement with the European Union, comprising a free trade area, political and cultural agreements. In 2003, an extensive free trade agreement with the United States. In 2004, a similar FTA was made with South Korea, expecting a boom in import and export of local produce and becoming a regional trade hub, continuing the coalition's free trade strategy. In August 2006, Bachelet concluded a FTA, the People's Republic of China, uh, with the PRC that uh, had been negotiated by President Lagos, and this was Beijing's first such FRA, or a free trade agreement, in Latin America. Now, and there's nothing but Chinese agreements, and China's become a major trade partner for most South American countries. Similar deals with Japan and India were promulgated in August 2007. In October 2006, Bachelet introduced a multilateral trade deal with New Zealand, Singapore, and Brunei. 
She lay and concurred with Washington's Trans-Pacific Strategy Economic Partnership, P4, also signed under Lagos' presidency, and regionally she has signed bilateral freight tra trade agreements with Panama, Peru, and Colombia. After 20 years, Chile went in a new direction with the win of center-right Sebastian Piñera in the Chilean presidential elections of 2009-2010. On 27 February 2010, Chile was struck by an 8.8 magnitude earthquake, the fifth largest ever recorded at the time. More than 500 people died, most from the ensuing tsunami, and over a million people lost their homes. Initial damage estimates were in the range of 15 to 30 billion U.S. dollars, around 10 to 15 percent of Chile's real gross domestic product, and Chile achieved global recognition for the successful rescue of 33 trapped miners in 2010. On the 5th of August 2010, the access tunnel collapsed at the San Jose Copper and Gold Mine in the Atacama Desert near Copiapo in northern Chile trapping 33 men 700 meters, that is, 2,300 feet below ground. A rescue effort organized by the Chilean government located the miners 17 days later, and all 33 men were brought to the surface two months later. On the 13th of October 2010, over a period of almost 24 hours, an effort that was carried on live television around the world. Now, good macroeconomic indicators for the IMF and World Bank, of course, mask the failure of Chile's neoliberal regime. The next generation of working masses have been educated as to the inevitability of capitalist laws sending them to the street. This led to the loss, once again, of the conservatives to the Social Democrat Bachelet. However, Chile's most class-conscious workers were least likely to be fooled by a right-wing social democracy and had been slaughtered or sent into what would turn into permanent exile. So today's task is to educate this new generation as the futility of economic uh, of uh, social reformism and the need for a human solution becomes increasingly apparent. Well, with those comments I'm going to stop right now and in the next lecture we're going to go on to Argentina unless the and this CIA-imposed regime in in uh, Brazil is on this on the verge of collapse. If that should happen within the next ten days or two weeks, we'll go back and do another lecture on Brazil. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to Argentina next time and talk about how uh, the U.S. imposed fascism at the same time on Argentina. And with those comments, I'm going to stop.